something with me this evening. Anybody like to play softball? Is it okay if I throw a softball in the church? Yeah. Oh, it's not. Okay. <laughs> then I better not. I'll just let it go. Well, I have a story to tell you this evening about a softball. And when I was a young boy, I'm going to guess, oh, maybe how old are you? Eight? When I was about your age, about eight years old, somewhere in there, we lived on a farm. And I liked playing softball. So one of my favorite things to do was when I came home from school, I would run inside, eat a snack, and I'd grab my glove and my ball, and I'd go outside. And we had this shop outside, and it was made out of block walls, and it was nice and solid. And so I'd take my softball. I probably shouldn't throw it against the wall in the church. But I'd take my softball outside by the shop, and I'd throw it against the wall. And I'd have a lot of fun. I'd throw it against the wall, and the ball would come bouncing back, and I'd catch it. Throw it against the wall, ball come bouncing back, and I catch it. There was one problem. In that shop, close to where I was throwing, there was a window. But I was a good thrower. I could throw really well. And that's fine if there's a window there. Don't need to worry about it. I'm throwing the softball. But one time, when I threw the softball, my aim was off. And what do you think happened? What do you think happened? Yeah, it didn't just crack. It broke. The window broke. Broke. Now what do I do? What do you think I should do? I was throwing the ball. I broke the window. What should I do? Buy a new window? I didn't have any money. That's a good idea. What else? Should, what else any other ideas? What should I do? What should I do? Clean it up. Okay, that's a good idea. I can get, get the broom. I can clean it up, hide the glass in the trash can, and go do something else. What do you think I should do? That's a bad idea. <laughs> they might spank me or punish me. Maybe make me pay for it. I didn't have any money. I was throwing the softball, and that's what happened. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there's this wonderful story that I want to tell you about this evening before I tell you what actually happened after I broke the window. The story is about the sons of the prophets. Now, they were some men that were kind of in like a college, and they were learning from their leader, Elisha, and he was teaching them. And they were kind of this college where they were sitting, where they were learning from. It was kind of like this bench here. It was a little tight. They didn't have enough of room. They were all squashed onto their, their seats, and it wasn't big enough. And so they said to Elisha, they said, Elisha, how about if we all go out to the Jordan, to the area of Jordan, and we cut down trees, we cut down beams, and we build a bigger place so that we have more room? And Elisha said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And they said, Elisha, why don't you come out along and go with us as we go and as we chop down these trees, get these beams to build a bigger place for us to meet in. And Elisha says, I'll go along with you. Now, one of the young men, and the Bible doesn't give him a name here. We don't have a name for him. But one of the young men, he didn't have his own axe, but he, had, he borrowed one to take along with him. So he borrowed his axe, and he went along with, with them to go chopping wood. And this young man was chopping. He was chopping a tree that was close to the river. It was close to the water. And he was there chopping away on his tree, chopping away. And one time when he swung his axe and he brought it back, the axe head flew off his hat, axe and went into the water. And where do you think it went when it went in the water? Where did it go? It went down to the bottom of the water. Now, he had a problem because it wasn't his axe. He had borrowed it from somebody else. So what's he to do? He looked around. He said, nobody's watching. He just stuck the axe head under the bushes and went back to the, back to the place where they were all working. Is that what he did? No, that's not what he did. He said, Elisha, he said, I have a problem. He said, this isn't my axe. I have borrowed the axe. And you know what Elisha said? He said, well, where did it fall? Where did the axe head fall? And he said, it fell right here in the water. And Elisha takes a stick and he throws it into the water. And the Bible says the axe head did swim. It came up to the top of the water. And the young man was able to reach out and to get it. He did the right thing because he said, this isn't mine. I need to return it. And Elisha helped him. Now, when I broke that window, 
I remember standing there looking at it and saying, what do I do now? It's pretty obviously broken. And it's pretty obvious who was throwing the softball. I may as well go and tell my parents. So I walked in and I told my mom, I broke a window in the shop. You know what? I don't remember what she did. I don't think she punished me. I think she might have told my dad later, and maybe I had to fix it or something. I don't know. Did you ever do something? Did you ever break something or lose something or ruin something that wasn't yours? And you're like, what do I do now? And you're scared. You're like, well, I don't want to tell somebody. I might get into trouble. But it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing when you ruin somebody something, when you break it, you lose something. It's the right thing to go to the owner, to go to mom and dad and say, here's what I did, and I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? That's way better than just hiding it, ignoring it, and not doing anything about it. Because sometime it's going to be found out. Okay? So the next time that something goes wrong... You're throwing the softball, you're playing with your friend's bike, or something happens and you break it, be right away to say, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I broke it. Okay? Don't try to hide it. That won't work. That's right. Don't try to hide it. Okay? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. All right. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, God, for all these children here. We pray your, your blessing on them, Father, and we pray, God, that when something goes wrong in their life, that you would help them to make the right choice to say, I was wrong, and I'm sorry, I've ruined it. I pray, God, that you would give them the strength to do that and the courage to take whatever punishment or whatever needs to be happen to correct it. Thank you for the story that we have in the Old Testament where you worked a miracle and made the axe head come back up out of the water. We pray your blessing on the rest of the service here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, children, thank you for being here this evening. You may go back to your parents. Turning your songs of faith and praise to song number 583. Songs of faith and praise, song number 583. Jesus flow like a river.
Good evening, and welcome. It's good to have you here again this evening. And to the young lady that uh, said I should tell my parents, that was the right answer. That was a good answer, and that was the correct thing to, to do. I invite your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I realize that we spent a lot of time in 1 Samuel last evening, and uh, we are going to uh, be in 1 Samuel 17 this evening. Very familiar story that we're going to be working from, the story of David and Goliath, which might be uh, one of the most familiar, one of our most favorite Bible stories within the Old Testament, within God's Word. The title of the message this evening is Fighting the Giants, Overcoming the Challenges that Go with Fighting Giants. 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, and then also verse 16 of 1 Samuel chapter 17, getting the story here of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together, to get, gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah and Ephesus Damon. Damon. And Saul, the men of Israel, were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the, on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his so shoulders. And the, spear, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye the servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then let us be your servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words in the Philist of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Jump down to verse 16. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. We're familiar with this story, but I'd like for us just to get an idea of the predicament that the Israelites were in. They had come out to do battle. They had got everything in order. They had set the battle in array. They were ready to do battle, but for 40 days, all that took place was Goliath would come out and would humiliate them, and would harass them, and would defy the armies of God. And they would shrink back in fear. Forty days. Think about that. That's a long time of them coming out, preparing to do battle, but nothing happening other than being humiliated by Goliath. And I can imagine that as every day went on, as this verbal abuse continued, with Goliath coming out and harassing them and, and, and taunting them, I can imagine that the morale in the Israelite camp just ebbed lower and lower and lower. They had prepared for battle, but nothing was happening. They were going nowhere. They had no progress, and all they had was Goliath coming out and humiliating them day after day. Maybe as you think about your life, you identify with the Israelite soldiers. Maybe there's a giant in your life that you're facing, that you're struggling against, that you would love to do battle with, that you would love to face, that you would love to take on, but instead you feel defeated and you haven't really done anything. You haven't even started engaging in a battle against this, this Goliath or this giant in your life. Maybe it's a besetting sin. Maybe it's a, a habit, a negative influence. Maybe it's doubt or anger. Maybe it's a, an addiction or something that you're struggling with that you just cannot get victory over. And to you, it seems like a giant. It's huge. It's insurmountable. And you can't figure a way around it. And it's not leaving on its own. It's just hanging around. And it's just there taunting you, tormenting you, causing problems in your life day after day. I think it's safe to say that if you're living and if you're breathing, 
And if you're a Christian, one who is desiring to walk with God, you have faced, or you are facing, or you will face a giant in your life. Something that looks very, very difficult. Something that looks almost impossible to overcome. And so this evening, we want to look at the story of David and Goliath, and we want to look at some of the challenges that go along with fighting giants. We want to break it down into bits of of smaller pieces and look at fighting giants and look at the challenges that we must overcome if we're going to be successful in overcoming the giant. The first challenge that we must overcome is this challenge of intimidation. 1 Samuel chapter 17, there verses 4 through 10, talk about the size of Goliath. Talk about the weight of his armor. Talk about how he looked, who he was. Everything about Goliath spoke of intimidation. Just his size, his physique, his looks, the armor that he wore spoke of intimidation. Think about trying to go up against a man that, and I think if I have my figures right, in our day and age is about nine feet, nine inches tall. Think about that. The next time you stand at a basketball hoop, imagine a person's head just a couple of inches from the bottom of the ring of a basketball hoop. Nine feet, nine inches tall, almost ten feet. I don't know where that puts us over here, if that puts us about the bottom of those louvers. That's huge. That's massive. The armor that he carried, the armor that he wore, all put together weighed about 272 pounds. Just the armor that he was wearing, that he walked around in like it was nothing. Normal armor in that day weighed about 60 pounds. He was massive. He was huge. He was intimidating. And then you have his, his verbal address of how he intimidated them with the way he spoke at them, the way he called out to them, the way he said, I defy the armies of the living God. I defy you. Choose you a man and come out and fight against me. Everything about him spoke of intimidation, putting you down. Simply by his presence and by his words, the Israelite army shrunk back. They were fearful. That's how giants are today. That's how giants are that you and I face. Simply by their presence in our lives, simply by the problem they bring, whatever it may be that it is that you are facing, that you think about when you think about giants, there is intimidation that goes along with that. It's a tactic of our enemy to intimidate us, to make us feel that we are defeated before we have even engaged in warfare. To make us feel that there is no hope of winning, there is no chance Simply by the size, by the the, the problem that we're facing, intimidation holds us in that grip and holds us powerless from moving forward and addressing the problem, causing us to shrink back in fear, causing us to say, you know what, it's hopeless, I can't do anything about it, it's just the way it is. Intimidation is a challenge that we must overcome if we're going to have victory over our giant. And the problem is, with intimidation, is many times it is simply in our minds. It is simply how we perceive the problem. It is simply because we are putting our focus on the problem at hand. We're putting our focus on the struggle at hand. We're putting our focus on that that broken relationship, that issue, whatever it is that we're dealing with. Whatever that giant is, we're putting our focus on that. And we're not putting our focus on God. We're not putting our focus on uh, the power of our God that we serve, but we're looking at this problem and we're focusing on that. And it intimidates us. It causes us to shrink back in fear and say, I can't do anything about it. We've lived at our, the place where we live now, the place that we live in Bowmansville, we lived there for about eight years now. And it's an, it's an old house. The, the deed says it was built in 1850. And one of the things that, uh, that has been a part of this old house when we moved in, and it still is a part of it, is there, the foundation is made out of old sandstones. It's, uh, it, it's an old foundation, very solid. Uh, but on the outside, there is stucco or there's mortar or plaster that goes from about the ground level up to where the siding begins. And this has, this has been ugly ever since we moved in. There's parts where the the mortar has, been, has fallen off, it's chipped off, it was painted several times, there was varying colors of paint. And this has been something that has bothered my wife from day one of when we bought the house and when we moved in. But I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know how to address it. 
And it just, to me, it just looked like a big problem. It wasn't that bad, but it was there. And I didn't know what to do about it. And so for eight years, I did nothing until the other weekend, about three or four hours of labor, and the problem was fixed. Just simply put some mud in some places, some concrete in some places, and paint it, and it looks wonderful. But I was intimidated simply by looking at the project and not knowing what to do about it. And I'm embarrassed about how long it took me to address it. It wasn't that big of a deal. But because of the intimidation, because I didn't know what to do about it, I did, I did nothing. That's a tactic of the en enemy. Keeps us in intimidation. Keeps us in fear. We don't know how to begin. We don't know what to do about it. And we do nothing. We haven't even started in engaging in the battle. For David, it was simple to see what the problem was. This man had defied God. This man was against God and needed address. And he was going to work through that and overcome intimidation. The second problem that we face with challenging when we face giants is the problem of isolation. The problem of isolation. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 through 10, we have how the Philistine, how Goliath addressed the Israelites, and he told them, he, he's a Philistine, come out and fight me. And he says, choose you a man and let him come down to me and let us fight. And if I kill him, you'll be my servants. If he kills me, I'll be your servants. And he says, send out a man, one man. I don't know the Israelites' thought process as to why they agreed to this. What prevented them from coming out with the entire army. Why did they stay there? It would have evoked an entire battle, but it would have got the battle started if they would have went out and addressed the Philistine as a group. But this is a tactic, this is a challenge that we have to overcome when we are facing our giants. When we're facing those struggles, far too often we are facing them alone, by ourselves, in isolation. The enemy loves to tell us, you're the only one who is facing this. You're the only one who is struggling with this. This is your problem. Nobody else wants to hear about it. Nobody else wants to know about it. Nobody else wants to come alongside of you. This is your problem. You take care of it. It's a tactic of the enemy to keep us isolated, to keep us thinking we are all alone. But that's not the way the church is to operate. That's not the way the brotherhood is to operate. The brotherhood is to rally together. The church is to work together, is to come alongside, is to rally around the one that is hurting, the one that is struggling, to walk alongside of them. Now, granted, this takes, if we're going to do this, this takes a level of honesty, a level of trust, of openness, of being willing to share what is going on in my heart, being willing to share what I'm struggling with, being willing to lay open and say, this is what I am facing. This is what I am dealing with. Will you come alongside of me? Will you pray with me? Will you walk with me? Will you help me? Will you mentor me? Will you make me accountable? Take me and be accountable to you. All throughout the New Testament, we are told to work together as a brotherhood, not in isolation. That is a tactic of the enemy. That is a, a, a challenge that we must overcome if we're going to be victorious in overcoming our struggles, overcoming our battles, overcoming our giants. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Come alongside each other. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Overcoming isolation is being willing to open yourself up to the brotherhood and say, This is my giant. It is this. I am struggling with this. I need help in overcoming it. I want to be victorious. I want to be an overcomer, and I'm not willing to face it alone. Will you come alongside of me and walk with me? I think of my journey as a young person, as a young man growing up. There was a besetting sin that I struggled with. I longed for victory. I wanted victory. I wanted to overcome it. I wanted to be victorious, and I tried hard by myself. I tried hard alone. And I wasn't successful. I wasn't victorious. It wasn't until I found an accountability partner that was willing to hold me accountable, was willing to walk closely with me, ask me the hard questions, check in on me, that I was able to find victory. Isolation 
doesn't win the battle. It is working together. It is walking together, overcoming that tactic of the enemy and saying, I have to face this alone. Overcoming isolation is where we find our way to victory. The enemy, like I said earlier, loves to tell us, you're the only one. This is your problem. No one else deals with this. No one else faces this. It's only you. You need to face this. And that's not the truth. That's not the truth. The truth is there is victory in coming together within the brotherhood and walking together. Seek out someone to walk with you. Go to someone, reveal and talk through the problem you're facing. Isolation is a, is a challenge that we must overcome. We talked about intimidation, uh, the, the process of the in enemy and just holding us there. We talked about isolation. The third challenge we have to overcome is the, the challenge of, over, of identifying truth. Identifying truth. When we are facing a giant, it is difficult to identify what is truth. It is difficult to identify in the midst of that what is the truth. And again, this is a tactic of our enemy to hold us in bondage. Because John chapter 8, verse 32 says, And the truth, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth brings freedom. And when we identify truth, we are on the pathway to deliverance in finding out what is truth. This is what fascinates me with David and the story of David and Goliath how, Goliath, how he identified truth, how he identified that Goliath was a problem. Goliath had defied God. Goliath was against God. Goliath had defied the armies of God. And besides that, David reached back into history, and he said, not only is Goliath against God and the problem needs to be dealt with, but if I look back in history and what God has done for me, God has helped me in overcoming the bear. God has, when I was taking care of my father's sheep, God has helped me in overcoming the lion, and I can trust God to take me through this difficult journey. I can trust God to overcome this giant. Goliath identified, uh, Goliath, <laughs> excuse me, David identified truth, and he identified the truth which gave him the power, gave him the courage to go forward. Now, there's two main truths that David identified. First of all, he identified that this problem, Goliath, was a problem against God. This was something that was anti-God that needed to be dealt with. He also identified that the strength, the victory comes through God, comes through following God, comes through the power and the strength of God. Both of those truths are important for us. If you're facing a besetting sin, if you're facing something that is just tearing you down, something that is against God's word, you need to identify that as a giant, as a Goliath, that must be taken care of because it is against God. It is an anti-God problem. It is separating you from God. If the giant that you are facing is a, is a problem, is a, a sickness, or it's an, just an unknown, uh, just something that seems insurmountable to you, you need to identify the truth that God is the one that provides you the strength. God is the one that gives you the power to move forward, to enable this. David identified this truth. And what I find fascinating is that when David identified this truth, when he talked about it with King Saul, if I can lay my eyes on it here in verse, verse 35, actually backing up to verse 33, when David talked with King Saul and he laid out to him that he wants to go out and fight him, he laid out for King Saul the truth of the situation and Saul got it. Saul identified the truth. He realized what the truth was in the situation, that this giant needed to be taken care of, and God was going to give the power. Saul saw the truth. Why else was he willing to entrust his entire army into the hands of this young man, this ruddy, ruddy, baby-faced David? Saul realized the truth, that God was going to be the one that gives him the power. David identified that. He verbalized that truth. David got it. Saul got a hold of it and gave him the power, gave him the authority to go out. Identifying truth in your struggle, the giant that you're facing, whatever it may be, is realizing that God is the one that is going to give you the power. God is the one that wants to bring you victory through his power, through his grace. 
We talked about the challenge of identifying truth, the challenge of isolation, the challenge of intimidation. The fourth challenge I think about here is the challenge of incorrect techniques. And I think about that because we see King Saul in verse 38 of chapter 17. We see King Saul, he wants to be helpful. And so he arms David with his armor. David had no armor. It says here in verse 38 that Saul armed David with his armor. He put in helmet of brass upon his head and also armed with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go. He tried to go for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Saul was trying to be helpful. He was saying, Here, here's this young man. He's going out to fight this mighty giant. I'm the king. I have the best armor. I'm going to give him my armor to go out and to fight this giant. But it wasn't the right way. It wasn't correct for David. It didn't fit him. It wasn't what he needed to go out and fight the giant. What he needed was his sling, his stones, and his shepherd's staff. That was a gifting, that was a skill, that was something he had, that he knew how to operate, not the armor that Saul had given him. And what I'm thinking about here with the idea of incorrect techniques is sometimes when we open ourselves up to the brotherhood or to somebody, we sit down, we talk with them, and they say, oh, I know, yeah, I, I, I had something similar to that, and this is what I did to overcome it. That's all you need to do. But it doesn't fit you. It doesn't fit your problem, and you feel defeated and you feel like there's no hope again because their solution didn't work for you. What I'm trying to do is encourage you to think about that it's not necessarily the other person's technique that's going to work for you. What they are trying to do is they're trying to offer you solutions, helpful ideas. You need to figure out and say, yes, that might work or it might not. Somebody that, as we talked about last evening, somebody that overcame pride by wearing dirty clothes all day might not be a good idea for you if, if you work in healthcare or in customer service. It's not going to fit. Somebody might have overcome their struggle by having an entire weekend of isolation, just them and God. That might not fit you because you're a mother at home with young children. It's a good idea, and the idea of taking time to dedicate time to God is important, but the technique that they're using might not fit you. Just as David attempted to use Saul's armor, it didn't fit him. It was an incorrect technique. He needed to use the skills, the abilities. He needed to use what he was used to working with, what fit him to overcome this giant, to fight this giant. Now, I'm not talking about the idea of whether or not we're tapping into God's power. We must be tapping into God's power. We must be finding ways to draw closer to God. And we want to be open to the advice of what others are suggesting, but we also need to make sure that we are fitting what fits for us and overcoming our giant. Not everybody else's idea is going to fit, and that doesn't mean the situation is hopeless, but you need to identify what works for you. Overcoming the challenge of incorrect techniques. One more challenge that we need to overcome that we're going to look at here this evening. This is where it gets really grisly and really gruesome in the story of David and Goliath in chapter 17 there, verses 48 through 51. I'm just going to read that. Chapter, eight, verse, chapter 17, verse 48 through 51. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took thence a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in, his, in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I love this idea of the way that David pursued victory to the very end. He didn't back up and he didn't quit when the giant was face down or laying on his back or when the giant was collapsed. He didn't walk over and check for a pulse and listen for any breathing and say, yep, he's dead, we're good. He made completely sure. He saw victory through to the very end. Even though he didn't even have a sword, he took Goliath's own sword to complete the job. 
And if you notice in verse 51, it wasn't until the head was off that the Philistines fled. Victory was sure. Their giant was dead. Sometimes when we're facing a giant, we're facing that, that besetting sin, that troubling thing, that problem, whatever it may be, we get a small taste of victory. We have a little bit of success, and we say, aha, I've got it. And we say we're done with the accountability partner. We don't need any more help. We got this figured out. I've overcome it. I know we've only been meeting for a week, but I've overcome. We're good now. And we're not seeing the victory through. We're not seeing the job the whole way through to the very end. We see a small taste of victory. We see the stone hit the forehead of the giant. We see the giant crumble. But he's not dead. The battle's not over. But we quit. And he comes back and he haunts us and he continues to pursue us. Incomplete victory is a challenge that we must overcome. We must see the journey, must see the, the battle through the whole way to the end to where we know that the giant is dead, where we are sure that the, that the problem is taken care of, that the, that the victory is won. That doesn't mean we'll never face it again. It doesn't mean that it will never come back again. But we are pushing through. We're not giving up at the first sign of a little bit of victory. We're pushing through and shoring that this giant is dead. This problem that we're facing is overcome. And we are going to continue to make sure that that giant stays dead. That the victory is complete. We're not going to allow it to come back. We're not just going to half-heartedly go on through the motions. But we're going to make sure that victory is, is complete. Incomplete victory. Be vigilant and press through. As we think about the story of David and Goliath, it's one of the, the familiar stories of the Old Testament. Probably one of the, the first stories that we, Bible stories that we've learned and we love because it's, it's the, the victory against all odds. It's overcoming the insurmountable options. The odds seem against David, but it's the overcoming. It's being victorious. And these stories are memorable. And what I desire for each one of us is that as we face and as we fight these giants, as we overcome those struggles in our life, we then have that memorable story of how God brought us victory through this giant. How we face this giant, how God brought us to victory over it, and we can look back at it as David talked about and said, God gave me victory over the bear. God gave me victory over the lion. I know he will give me victory over the next giant I'm going to face. I know he'll give me the strength to overcome.